Hello, hello and welcome to another exciting episode of Arms Innovation Coffee. I'm Alessandro Grande, joined by my awesome co-host, Robert Wolf. And in this episode, we will be meeting with the machine learning team from Avnet, talking to us about Double Buddy. So they've created an AI player to play double with. I mean, that's, uh, you know, that's an interesting idea in its own. And uh, I'm really curious to see this in action. So I haven't seen it yet. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to this. We'll, they'll talk us through how they created it, but also all the maths behind it um, and you know all the work they've done behind the scenes. Before we dive into the, the episode though, um, and the recap, I just wanted to rem remind everyone to smash the like button and subscribe to the ARM Software Developer YouTube channel. And with that, Robert, do you wanna talk us through the recap? Of course, yeah. Thank you, Alessandro, very much. And uh, welcome everyone to ARMS Innovation Coffee. Yeah, very excited about today's episode. But as Alessandro mentioned, we're going to talk real quick about last week's episode, who was with or with whom it was. <laughs> we, we spoke to Sean Heimel. Uh, Sean Heimel is an engineer and content creator, does amazing stuff on YouTube and has basically been all over the internet doing all sorts of cool tech stuff, break breakdowns and, and uh, uh, showcasing really cool demos. But in last week's episode, we talked about DIY developer marketing. Uh, we got to talk to him about all the cool stuff he builds, how he kind of builds his networks um, around uh, the things that he's doing in this space. And he also walked us through a new course, Coursera course that he's building. Now, um, this is all about TinyML and all the interesting things around that space. But if you want to kind of follow more about that, of course, you can cruise on over to the Arm Software Developer YouTube channel. You can get access to that video. Don't watch it just yet. But if you have an extra spare hour in your week, go check that out. If you want to uh, learn more about Sean Heimel, there's his Twitter channel. So uh, you can also go follow him there and learn more about uh, the things he does. I think that was, was that, was that good enough recap there, Alessandro? <laughs> yeah, no, that's. That, that was great. I mean, uh, as we said last week, that was a bit of a, a test episode. We've done, uh, you know, tech episodes for six months, and that was the first kind of non-tech episode. Uh, still related, but you know, less less of a less of a tech uh, only episode at least. Um, and actually, you know, we had some good comments, so maybe we'll do more of those. But uh, you know, it's time to actually talk about today's episode. So. As we said, you know, it's going to be an interesting show. We have three guests on, and I think it's time to bring him on. Robert, what do you think? Let's do it. Let's do it. So we've got with us three episodes, three, sorry, not three episodes, three people. <laughs> uh, Kevin, Kevin, a uh, machine learning specialist at Avnet, um, Mario, another machine learning specialist at Avnet, and then Monica, another machine learning specialist at Avnet. So we're, you know, it's a full, um, team of machine learning engineers. So I'm really excited to learn, you know, all the great work they've done and, and hear directly from them. So hi guys. Hey, Welcome. Alessandro. Hi, Robert. Hi, thanks for having are us. We, are we going to try doing a, a cheers here? Oh. Maybe we can all, all <laughs> link our, our screens together. <laughs> clink, clink. <laughs> to innovation cheers. and to coffee. <laughs> yeah, cheers. Thank you for joining us. This is awesome. Yeah, so- Cool, um, so- you Sorry, yeah, please, please. <laughs> no, let's get it started. I mean, I, I'm keen started. to like hear your ba your background story. So, uh, Kevin, you're the first on the screen. So, do you want to go first? Yeah, tell us absolutely. a bit about yourself. Uh, so, my name is Kevin Carrick. Uh, I've worked at Avnet for over ten years now. Um, I started out working in the boards group here at Avnet, uh, creating demo boards and helping them out with firmware and example designs. And I've since moved into a different group. Uh, we worked a lot on a board called the Zed board, which was really big in the community. It was the first uh, low cost Zinc 7000 board for Xilinx and kind of evolved out of that. We had like a mini Z and a Pico Z and an Ultra 96 that ev eventually evolved out of that with the Zinc Ultra Scale Plus family. And then eventually we started working with the group at six boards and we created a Ultra 96 board. Uh, so that one was something that was a big splash for us uh, a few years ago. And we've continued to develop applications. Uh, my colleagues, they were working on NXP applications as well. But it, really lately, we've been focusing a lot on machine learning applications. And that's that's what we were here to share today is like a lot of the stuff that we've done on machine learning and AI. Awesome. 
Thank you for that, Kevin. Uh, Monica, do you want to go next? Sure, yeah. Um, so I've been on part of Kevin's team for about a year. Before that, I was at Hexter.io, if you're familiar with that. Um, so yeah, we drove a DeLorean around the country and, and we've done like a lot of with Hackster. Um, but now I'm on Kevin's team, which is awesome, working on machine learning and I'm also doing a part-time master's degree focused on machine learning. So it's all machine learning all the time. Awesome, thank you, Monica. Yeah, I remember the the, the hacks at times. They were fun, and I, you know, I could see that you're doing some fun stuff here as well. So I'm excited to see uh, in more details what you guys have built. Mario, you're up next. Yeah, well, I'm Mario Bergeron, and um, I'm from Canada, originally Alberta. I'm mentioning that because that's the that's why I chose this Alberta beef for my avatar name there. That's where that comes from. If anyone was asking. <laughs> So yeah, so I've been working in the industry for quite a while. Uh, I started off actually uh, in Vancouver working um, on an ASIC team, then moved on, came back to uh, Quebec province and and uh, worked on a lot of development boards, uh, DSP, FPGA based, and now with Avnet, I've done a lot of uh, work uh, specifically on development boards that have image sensors. So a lot of video, embedded vision, and lately, uh, I find myself really lucky to be uh, having a job where I can look at machine learning. And I do have to say, it's kind of like the uh, imposter syndrome when it comes to machine learning. Uh, but I remember being at a presentation where someone said, if you ever meet someone who says they know everything about mach machine learning, they're the imposter. <laughs> yeah, so I think machine learning is just, it's a journey. It's just continual learning, learning how to do machine learning. Yeah. I, I think I think if you meet anyone who tells you they know everything about anything, <laughs> they're, they're an imposter. But yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah, we're pretty lucky to be able to do these things. Yeah. Very nice. Nice to meet you all. Hi. Right, thanks for having us on. Yeah. Thanks for having us on. We've yeah. been watching a bunch of the episodes. We saw you had Alex Glow from Hackster on. You had some of the folks from Edge Impulse on there. That was a really awesome episode. So we're really excited to to be on here to share our story. Cool. So I, I think this breaks us into the what is Dobble, what is Dobble Buddy, and maybe one of you can take that question so we can kind of break the ice here and get people familiar with the term because we're throwing out this Dobble quite a bit and I don't know if anyone even knows what that is. So who's yeah. gonna who's gonna take that question? What is Dobble and what is Dobble Buddy? So I'll take that because it'll give me a good intro into showing the demo here that I have running on my desktop. So. In, internationally, there's a card game called Dobble. In the United States, it's called Spot It. But we tried to make this a more international thing so that, that way we can share and uh, be more relevant with the rest of the folks around the world that are also using Avnet boards, are also using ARM products. And this is a great example of uh, a way that we've trained something on a PC and then deployed it out to a bunch of ARM boards. So here you see, uh, this is right here on my on my desk here. I have a set of Dobble cards that I've thrown down. It's the idea behind Dobble is you, you try to match up these symbols here. And what, we, what, what we've done with Dobble Buddy is Dobble Buddy is basically uh, play in, in artificial intelligence that's playing against you. So for anybody who's you know, maybe like, quarantining by themselves or you know they have to maintain social distance and you don't have somebody to play with you can play against the ai and see if you can beat the ai so the idea here is that we've um we'll go into some of the math behind it but we've all we've trained this on the pc um but let me let me switch cameras here really quick if i can if i can turn this demo off right here i'll show you how we've actually gone and deployed this onto uh, some of the arm boards so i have here behind me a set of arm boards uh, i got an Ultra 96 running over here, which is a Xilinx Zinc Ultra Scale Plus, and then I also have a Max board here uh, that's also running the same application with a camera. So let me switch my cameras here, and then I'll drag my camera out there to, to give a little bit closer close-up view of that. Let me know if the camera switches over okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. All right, so now for the fun part here. I'm going to move my camera over there without without dropping it or anything. All right, got a little, got a little tripod here. I can set this up on. Everybody, everybody see that setup pretty well. Yep. Okay, good. All right, so I'll start with Maxboard since that's the one that's facing right here. So I got Maxboard set up right here, and Monica will walk through a little bit of the details behind the setup. But basically, like a camera facing down, 
I got two double cards right here. Like I can move the double cards out. You can see, you know, it takes a little while for it to update on the screen here because uh, we have like a little neural network pipeline that we're filling up. Uh, but basically you see here, we're getting about one frame per second and we're doing a pretty good job of matching up the symbols on the, on the card. So this one right here, you can see the matching symbol is this little target symbol, um, this little red target symbol right here. So then if we, we point it over to the Ultra 96 board over here, let me move it over here. We have the same exact Python application running, but it's using a hardware accelerator that's running inside the programmable logic that Mary will talk a little bit more about how that works, but we're running, uh, this is also on uh, ARM Cortex A53 uh, processing system, but it's using Xilinx programmable logic uh, to accelerate the, our neural network app. Uh, algorithm inside of that. So you can see we're getting a little bit more frames per second on this one. This one averaged about seven frames per second. And then, um, you know, we'll get into talking about like the application and some of the math behind it and what makes this such an interesting problem. And, you know, not just a fun game to play, but an interesting machine learning problem that we solved. Um, I also have some power meters hooked up here and we'll get to those two. Uh, we're measuring the power on each of those platforms. Let me see if I can get in here so we can see the numbers here. So here's our Here's our Ultra 96 power. So you can see we're we're given some real numbers here at the end when we do our little summary. And then here's our max board power right here. Got about 4.7 watts running right now. Okay, well that's about that's about it for the demo. We're gonna get into like the some of the more nerdy stuff behind it a little bit. Uh, I, love, me... I love the fact I love the fact that you you know you're you're actually showing the power consumption. I think that's really interesting because a lot of the demos that we see, you know, that I see all the time are just about the machine learning side, right? And it's like, oh yeah, it's, you know, it's power efficient, but actually is it, right? <laughs> that's a yeah. question I always have, right? And and here actually you can see the power consumption. I love yeah. that. So, well, one of the um, things that, I'm really... that we, one of the things that we want to highlight at the end is along those lines, it's like, it's not just the performance, it's not just the cost of the board, but it's also the powers. Nears to machine uh, algorithm to make those engines ahead of time decide, okay, well, that's operated power or it's something that I'm looking at. And so we're going to be showing a little bit of that at the end to help help people see um, you know, what those different trade-offs are. Did he just cut out or was that was that me? Did he cut out? Yeah, yeah, no, he's breaking up. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> that, 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 that's, it, that's, it, that's a beauty. That's the beauty of doing a live stream, right? <laughs> yeah. Back, I think. But the demo worked. I mean, the demo, the demo was perfect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Good job. <laughs> okay. Good. So, so, uh, so usually we show these demos towards the middle or end of the episode. This is kind of a treat, I think, to have it at the beginning, and maybe we can kind of dive back into it a little later, and maybe show a few more things. But you touched on the importance or why the motivation behind creating this. And I think, uh, I think it's important to kind of hear a little bit from each of you, uh, maybe a little bit of why you were each motivated to participate in this project and help build this out. Um, so I think the question we have here is, why did you make this Double Buddy project? And what was the motivation behind this? And we can kind of, I guess, Kevin, you kind of already talked about it a little bit. So let's switch over to Monica and then we'll go to Mario, then come back to you. Sure. Does that work? All right, Monica, you're <laughs> Cool, yeah. So one of the motivating things was um, just wanting to compare machine learning on the different AVNet boards. So uh, we were able to target a couple different embedded ARM platforms that we had Max board and then Ultra 96, which you just saw. And we also want to continue to work on a bunch of different embedded ARM platforms and ask the community to contribute it as, as well, possibly. So um, I also did a benchmarking project last fall. And so it's just really interesting to see like the practical, not very practical, but uh, you're playing a card game, but um, the machine learning running on these different boards with different power consumption, different uh, different frames per second. Yeah, I feel that there's there's a lot of there's a lot of potential with with these types of, of games, and I, I don't think people are really tackling it that much, right? Like, I mean, kind of mixing a, an analog game into the digital world, right? Like, how <laughs> how many of those really are there? Where we we see all this AR and VR stuff coming out, right? But hmm. There, there really isn't that much happening. And so I think that this is really a cool, a, a cool, a cool game. I mean, I, I would be excited to get it and build this project myself. So um, kudos. Awesome. What about you, Mario? Yeah, I think another thing that motivated, well, you know, on this learning machine, machine learning journey, 
uh, a lot of the tutorials and the, the material that you run into, it usually starts uh, with a given data set. So I think one of the big motivators that got us embarked on this is, okay, let's, let's see what's involved in creating our own data set. And um, yeah, it's not simple. There's a lot of, lot of <laughs> potentially a lot of work behind it. So um, yeah, so we wanted to create an example that started from nothing. Well, an idea, of course, but like we, we actually built everything. So we didn't go uh, use a data set um, that existed. We created our own data set and, and built on top of that. So I, there's room for improvement in the project, but it's it was really interesting to take that from the very start and have something that's working with a live stream at the end. So so these cards already existed, right? Like Dobble yes. already existed in the card. You didn't make these cards, but you made the system. You made the buddy that reads the cards and plays with you. Exactly. I mean, I'd imagine. Yeah. And, and so you had to take all. Yeah, there you go. It's a little so you training. Had to take, you had to take all these cards and you had to uh, essentially train the double buddy with these cards. Yeah. Yes. Okay, cool. Was it a difficult process? I mean, uh, or, or you, you said you wrote all of this stuff out. Was it a difficult process getting it all trained? Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. I would say it was, well, there's a lot of good tutorials on like just like, doing a classifier. So that was um, like pretty standard, but it was the creating the data set that was the, the, the bigger challenge. Uh, like a lot of this was done manually. And I think with hindsight, um, should have looked more into the annotation tools that exist and uh, leverage those. So that that's <laughs> lessons learned um, from my side anyway. Awesome. And I, I, you know, I like Kevin, how you talked about the motivation of, you know, we're in this quarantine all alone um, and looking for someone to play cards with this. This doesn't seem like something that maybe it is. I've never played double, but this doesn't seem like something that would be so easy to play on like a zoom call or would it be? Yeah, um, no, I, I think you probably, if there's not a lot of lag, I think if you have a lot of lag, there's maybe some arguments over who won the round. Uh, but, uh, you know, I mean, for me, like the motivation was not only to create the game for other people to play, but then uh, like kind of like what Mario was saying is like, do you train like an AI network? How what what where does that start in, you know, breaking down a problem and then taking your work and then sharing that with other people so they can jump on it. Like that was, that was a big part of it for me is being able to share it. And then Hackster makes that possible because we could take our work and we can share that on the Hackster IO um, pages and show the different projects and other people can follow along with their work. You know, they could use our work as a starting point for their own work and not have to repeat a lot of the work that we did and can something even what we've created. Yeah, it seems like it seems like someone could take the work you did on the double buddy side, like the buddy side, and create all sorts of other games with that. Just you know, leveraging the stuff that you've put into this, um, trying to to build out some other or converting some other games into you know standalone play with the double buddy via <laughs> I don't know, so, not so, so, I was gonna say solitaire buddy. You could play a play a, a what is it? Um, uh, rummy, rummy buddy. <laughs> play gin rummy with a with your computer. But yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's some math behind that that I think I think Mario has like some slides that we we've prepared to talk a little bit about the math behind the double game itself that lends it well to being something that could be solved with an AI uh, algorithm. Cool. So, yeah, um, this, you want to put up pull up the slides, Kevin? Or um, yeah, I can do that. Can everybody see my see my desktop here? There we go. Yeah. So who's controlling? So we kind of already talked about this, like the motivation behind doing this game. Uh, and we've got two of our links there to the Hackster projects. Uh, so I won't reiterate, but basically we wanted to do something where we also included the data set, created and trained a model. We wanted to have this running on a live stream. And ultimately we wanted to deploy this to uh, some of our embedded boards, which have ARM processors. So, uh, so that was mission accomplished and it was very uh, <laughs> interesting journey. Do you want to advance the slide, Kevin? Yep. Mario, if I may, if I may interrupt one second, I was just going to say that you know the the first time I heard about machine learning, actually AI, was actually when I when I started hearing. I was back at university, or maybe even at school, when I started hearing about you know the the first uh, chess wins from an AI, you know, like an AI winning against a chess a chess master. Yeah, the idea. And then recently, 
um, actually, I think it's 2000, uh, I think it was around, I actually don't know, I don't remember exactly the date, but there was a, a day when um, there was a, a machine that won against uh, AlphaGo, um, you know, an AlphaGo player, and that was like the big, uh, the big, you know, kind of, um, big target, right? Because it's AlphaGo is much more complex game. So I really like the approach that you guys took to kind of learn the steps of AI by building an AI that actually, uh, you know, is able to play against a simple game, right? But the steps are the same, and then you can expand this and and iterate, you know, and, and make it for another uh, game as well. So, so I'm really curious about the steps. So, please go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's interesting because there's a, there's someone. Uh... Who is he called Ray Kurzweil? Who kind of said, uh, "We'll, we'll, con we'll con humans continually try to differentiate themselves with robot robotics or or AI by by like we used to say, well, uh, a machine can't win at chess, and when that happened, well, we defined another <laughs> definition that would separate us from robots, and that was like the AlphaGo, and that's been achieved as well. So it's a never ending. We're always trying to differentiate ourselves from this." All this technology that's getting uh, very good at a lot of stuff. And now, and yeah. now it's like uh, machines. Will, machines can't drive as well as we can. Yeah, but, yeah. I mean, yeah sure that's... Enough, we'll, we'll hit that stage five, and next thing you know, they're they're going to be driving yeah. better than us. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So back to the simpler example <laughs> with the double game. It's actually a game that we think is is international. It goes under different names, so double or spotted, like Kevin mentioned. And there are variants to this game. Like um, there's the, the three pairs of images on the right. You can see those are some of the differences that we saw. Like uh, on one on one deck, you'll have a purple bird, whereas another will be the purple OK. So some of the uh, images are replaced with words, like the brown hammer with stop and the green turtle with art. Uh, but the idea with by just including these variations in the data set, like we're we're letting the AI figure it out by itself, right? We're not actually designing features and and building up a, a traditional computer vision system. We're just the goal was to explore what machine learning can offer just by concentrating on building a, a sufficiently uh, uh, complete data set. So the game is interesting in the sat in the sense that it's it's essentially a pattern matching, right? We're trying to find images that are on more than one card as fast as we can so there's a speed player so that makes it an interesting a candidate for implementing this with ai so so that's that's how we chose it what advanced kevin uh the math with respect to the math there's um martin whitworth created a presentation and i put the link here um he, he gave this presentation in 2012 at this math jam conference and he explained the game and the math behind the game and he his presentation is really well done. I'd refer, if, if anyone wants to go a little deeper into the math, I would uh, definitely look that up on Google and you'll find it. So it's essentially, in summary, a finite projective plane of order n equals seven, which means that you have n cubed plus n plus one is 57 cards, and you've got the same number of symbols. Um, so the way that this is laid out in the cards is every symbol will show up on eight cards in the whole deck, and every card will have eight symbols on it. So next animation, Kevin. So essentially when you have, for every two cards, there'll be one and only one matching symbol. So that's kind of like what's really cool about it. For all these, all these and, and on the printed card games, there's actually only 55 cards. Uh, I don't know why. Why didn't they print uh, 57 cards? There was maybe a, there's maybe some hidden rules in card games that you can only print 55 cards. I don't know. <laughs> but that's that's basically the math behind it. It tricks the mind a little bit, too, because I was expecting, when I'm looking at those cards, I saw the snowflake was what was repeated, but the snowflake were different sizes on yeah. those cards. And so my mind's going, wait, I'm looking for a similar shape and size, and that wasn't happening. And so I'm guessing yeah. that that also screws with us, maybe not as much with the computer. Yeah, you do get used to it, but there's sometimes I'll see two cards. Like I've played this game a lot with my my kids and my friends. Uh, sometimes you'll see it right away. It's like, oh, I'm getting good at this. And then other times you just stare and you just can't see it. Like, no. where is it? Where is it? There's an error, but you know there's no error. Um, yeah, it's, it's yeah. So we're uh, I think we're our response time is. Uh, Pretty undeterministic <laughs> compared to uh, what a computer can do. 
Nice. Is there another slide? And and yeah, don't ask you why. Oh, there you go. The matching snowflakes. Yeah. Guess so, it. I win. Yeah. So 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 the way we, so the way we created this data set is we basically took our webcams and we we captured images. So like we did this with a MATLAB script and we've got a Python script as well. But uh, so we just took we created ten decks. So one of the decks is from Martin Whitworth's presentation, which has that variation. And all the others we recruited ourselves. And I, we put this up on Kaggle so that anyone could uh, use it. And, and there's also a Hackster project with that link that's there that describes the data set, how we created it, describes each of the 10 decks. And we also have two test sets. So there's like, a, started off with the first test set is just a random choice of 12 images. It's not very complete. But the second one is, was actually a game that was played and we extracted the cards. So those images are pretty interesting because there's a lot of uh, blurring and like images that you would see in a in a real scenario. So so we trained it on the on the the ten training sets. And then the goal here is that that second test set, which is over one thousand images, that's what we use to to uh, measure the accuracy of of what we've created. So that's so that's. Like for machine learning, you want something that with which you'll test, but that the training is not allowed to look at. So that's how we set it up. So so let me let me get this straight. Uh, so you've got the training set. The training set contains card that the the then the test set doesn't have, or vice versa. The, the test set has cards that training set doesn't have, or is it the the order in which they come up? Is it actually um, new cards? Well, they're all like every every card. It, it's a it's a cropped image. Yeah. So it's not. Uh, so the, so what we did is not a detection uh, model. It's just a classification model. So we need to first extract where those cards, and then we'll classify them. Um, so in the training sets, we have every card in the deck, and in the test set, the second test set, um, I think all the cards are there because we we played with all the whole deck. So. But it's just in the other one, there's more variance. Like the, the same card might show up like uh, 10 times, but one of them will be blurred. One of them will be crocked a little differently. And we get pretty wacky, wacky things going on. Yeah. Interesting. Cool. And we could actually, we actually have slides on that too. We'll talk about the, uh, so this is basically what's, what's running, what Kevin was showing, right? The, the pipeline. We start with a detection where that, that's not done with machine learning, it's just a traditional computer vision. So it's just finding circles in the image. So that's why here we have like a contrasting background so that it helps us out here. That's definitely something that could be improved, but that was not where we put our attention. And after that, so we want to crop and resize those images before sending it to a classifier. I think there's an animation there, Kevin. Yeah. So that's the detection part. Then the classification part is for each image that we have, we just spit out an ID. And the ID is, was arbitrarily chosen. We have like just 57 possible cards. Uh, we chose zero to be a non-playing card because if you flip the cards upside down, they actually still show up as circles. And we, we wanted to recognize that, hey, that's not a playing card. Don't try to match it with another one. Uh, and basically the, the, final, uh, the final box there in the pipeline, the display results, is essentially a lookup table. So once we have these IDs for all the cards, we know which symbols are on the card, mm -hmm. and we're just going to find the, the match. Now, you'll notice that the way we implemented it, we didn't actually, we're not going to show you on the card, this is the symbol that was matched, because that's not how the game was played. You just see the cards, and, you, and you'll voice out, like Snowflake, like for the previous example, and the first one to say it gets the point. So... In a similar way, we're, we're classifying the cards as a whole. And from there, we have these lookup tables that tell us what the matching symbols are between any two cards. So that's kind of what our, our code looks like. And this is the network that we implemented. It's a pretty standard classification network. So it's a bunch of uh, in neural in convolutional neural networks. Uh, these things are implemented as layers. And all these layers perform different mathematical functions or operations. So uh, so the pretty standard classical model for um, classifying images is you'll have these stacks of convolution and pooling layers. So convolution is, for those who are familiar with uh, image processing, it's 
you could use a convolution to find edges, things like that. You can blur and sharpen an image. So, so these are like mathematical operators that are very good at finding features in images, right? So we're not telling the network to look for edges or this. It's in the learning part, it's going to decide on its own what's most uh, beneficial and it adjusts its weights as it's being, as it's being trained. So all these convolution and pooling layers, um, there's a dropout layer at the end of that first part, which is the, I guess we call it the front end. Um, and the dropout is just to help in the learning phase, not something that will actually be uh, implemented in the inference. And then at the end of that, we have the classification. So these are all like these fully connected layers where they're looking at all the results from the previous layers and trying to match all these features that the model has determined itself in order to uh, classify the outputs that we're looking for. So like we said, we have zero for a non-playing card and we have the remaining 57 uh, numbers corresponding to each of the playing cards. Mario, a quick question on this actually. Um, how did you choose the the network that you were gonna, or the layers? Uh, so did you go through like trial and error? Is the uh, papers that you read that are kind of doing similar things? Like what was your approach there? Well, I think if you look at like the the hello world of machine learning, it would be probably the MNIST data set. MNIST, like the, just recognizing the numbers from zero to nine. So uh, MNIST, I forget what the acronym is, but it's a, um, uh, an international standards organization of some sort. And it's, I think it's the US post office that, that developed this just to help reading the zip codes on, for, the, for the mailing service. So if you look at that, like which is I think the Lenet is the name of that network. It's very similar to this. There are a few differences, like um, the convolution layers have uh, in parentheses, you can see I've got ReLU there. Those are activation layers. And that's basically um, adding non-linearity to the network. And that's really important because uh, if you think of all these th layers as just being mathematical uh, equations, if there's no, if everything is linear, it'll actually simplify to one single layer and then it defeats the purpose. It's not a deep um, neural network anymore. So at, at each of these stages, you need a non-linear, and that's the magic of, uh, it was actually a, a huge break, breakthrough in the machine learning history where once they started using these nonlinear layers, they were able to do things um, that were not possible before. So, oh. yeah, so so where did the, that architecture come from? Uh, based on things that I've seen uh, going through tutorials and examples that are well-documented, yeah. So not, nothing new here. We're using a pretty standard architecture. Great all question. This, cool. All this, all this talk of, uh, of convolution is triggering my DSPTSD. <laughs> <laughs> gotta do all your signal processing dad jokes no <laughs> uh, but yeah no yeah that, that's that's awesome i mean i've never i've never officially um created anything like this but i've done all sorts of convolution paper engineering um so this is really cool to see this in practice and of course like you know some 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 one-offs in matlab and stuff but this is awesome uh yeah. to break like this down like one thing we ran into, if you're like, if you're paying attention on how we did our data set, right? We have like these 10 decks where we have one image of each card. And it turns out that that's actually not a lot of data. And so we did have a hard time training. So this is probably where I'll pass the puck to Monica because she, she, she kind of really used some techniques to, to, to get us into a, um, a situation where we were getting good results without having to like capture these thousands of images, which would have taken forever. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. Thanks, Mario. Cool. Yeah. So we had we we each took. I think Kevin did the most decks. Took photos of the most decks. Um, so we ended up with ten different um, decks. So like Im uh, images of the of the fifty five cards. So fifth. Uh, what's that? Um, yeah. So five hundred and fifty images. Um, but apparently that's not enough <laughs> to have a really accurate model. This is the uh, model's accuracy. We have two different test deck, uh, test sets. One of them, the second one is uh, about 1,200 different images. And the accuracy on that was only 
So not great unless you really want to dumb your model down so you can beat it every time. <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> <laughs> um, so to fix that, I needed to figure out how to get more data. Um, so the next thing, so I wanted to augment the, the data set. Um, oh, this is with the, this is after augmenting the data set. This is our final accuracy it was 99.7%. So almost perfect on the test set of 1200 images, which again, um, so accuracy is not just a number, it's a distribution. <laughs> uh, so this is only 1200 images, a fairly small test set. Um, so that just is showing that it's doing well on our, on our test set, although it also showed um, really good uh, accuracy when we actually played it. So, um, yeah, I can move Monica, we have a question. That. Yeah. We have a question from the audience. Um, so I'll pull it up here. So Caesar is asking, have you applied rotation that data augmentation during training as cards are round shaped on inference as the card orientation affect the classification performance? Are you able to talk uh, to that? Yes, it definitely. Uh, so it it did. So originally, actually, Mario just created a script to to rotate each card by one degree, um, but that still wasn't enough to get it a great accuracy. So I realized I need to do some more augmentation. Oh, is there another hey. question? Yeah. Yeah, Monica, you should show your slides on the augment. How the it's it's a good uh, way to visualize what was done. Yeah. Okay, okay so these are the, some of the up, test yeah. the test set images. So you can see like in the test set there's a couple of images that aren't perfect. They have like um they're out of the they're out of the frame, they're out of they're a little bit blurred. Um and so then uh our our actual decks, our 10 decks. This is uh card 1 in all 10 different decks. And there's some different lighting and different um there's like different pixelations, but you can see that they're all really well centered. So I wanted to do some data augmentation that would skew them a bit, um, as well as doing some like uh, some, some other things that would be more accurate to what you would actually see in real life when playing the game. Sorry, I may have missed it, but do yeah. when people when people build this for themselves, do they get access to your data sets or do they have to build out these data sets as well? So we that's a good question. We do have a data set on Kaggle. Um, okay. but we don't have we don't have the augmented data set on Kaggle, do we guys? No, uh, but they can they can generate it with the, the script. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it would be it would be too huge for people to download the augmented <laughs> data set. I, I generated yeah. it. And I had to like delete a whole bunch of stuff off my laptop because it's over sixty gigabytes in size. Oh wow! By the time we wow. generate it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the normal data set size for training a neural network is between a thousand to a hundred thousand images per label. So that would be for the minimum data set size, we'd have to have fifty five thousand images. So that's how many we actually generated to get that 60 gigabyte <laughs> data set. Um, and Mario actually wrote two scripts. And I think your scripts, Mario, were better than a lot of the annotation tools anyways, especially for this task, because they take the, they crop them really nicely. And there's a Python script and a MATLAB script. This is the MATLAB script that you're seeing here. But even if it only took five seconds per card, that's still three days of continuously collecting data. Wow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is like I guess is why people use like only, mechanical Turk and stuff for data sets. And this is only fifty-five pictures. I mean, fifty-five. Sorry, different images, right? That you're trying to classify. Exactly yeah, right. so we were trying to get a thousand, a thousand images of each card. Yeah. To make a big enough data set, um, so fifty-five thousand photos, three days of continuous uh, picture so when taking. You, so when you're showing this, right, like you put the image, you put the card, sorry, in the center of that, um, of the screen. And then do you, I mean, here you're moving it around. So for each card, I, you have to move it around or do you have the script to automatically like rotate it and crop it and all that? Uh, the script automatically rotates and crops it. Although sometimes it has trouble picking up the borders. So you should be seeing like a red border, but it's, <laughs> this is not a great GIF because we don't actually see the red border here. But yeah, right there where you see the red and the blue 
border. Yeah, you, you see it briefly there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure yeah, yeah. 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 Cool. So, you, so you're not you're not moving the, the picture manually. You're you're having the script do that, and that's enough to actually uh, have a big enough data set or a diverse enough data set. You don't have to rotate it manually or do anything, you know, like um, where you sh tilt it or anything like that. That if we actually did it manually, we would have to do that. Um, that would take forever because <laughs> you'd have to make a note of each rotation. Um, so we ended up uh, using Keras has some really cool tools for generating, for actually generating the data. So this is the image data generator class in Keras. There are a bunch of different shifts that you can do. You can do height shift, width shifts, brightness, zoom, which also adds some skew. So like if you're holding the card, you know, if you're doing this with the card, it will still be able to pick it up. So yeah, so I had to pick out a bunch of these that would kind of be what you would see in real life. Um, so I, I chose the, the brightness, um, random rotation, vertical or horizontal shift, and random zoom. They don't have a blur one, which would have been really helpful because the our our camera had some trouble focusing sometimes. So that would have been that would probably would have even given us better accuracy. And there's also a bunch of transforms that we didn't use. So there's some pretty like horizontal or vertical flip. We don't want to mirror the card because that won't help very much. Um, that'll actually create pro more problems. Shear range, obviously, you don't unless your cards are like made of bubble gum. <laughs> Um, and then there's some, some interesting ones that did some cool effects. I think you're supposed to use these two together, sample-wise center and sample-wise standard normalization to kind of normalize the white balance of all the images. Um, sample-wise normalizes the white balance of a single image across the image. And then there's one that's um, feature-wise normalizes the entire data set to the white balance. So yeah, here's our, our resulting data set is 60 gigs huge. And then um, we also had to retrain the model. So the original model only took about, on, on the ZBook, it took about half an hour to train. And then to retrain it with the huge data set, it took almost 30 hours. Without a GPU. Without a GPU, <laughs> yes, yeah, okay. So that, that's without yeah. requiring a, a huge machine, <laughs> how much time it takes to train. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like you said, saw before, 99.6 or 99.7, depending on the, um, well, actually, it, it so depending on um, the, the data set, so I augmented with a different data, like my augmented data set is different than Kevin or Mario's augmented data set, because we ran the scripts to augment it. Yeah. And so it did, you know, for every card, it did a different skew, a different rotation. Um, so I think Mario saw 99.7% accuracy, I saw 99.6% accuracy, so, even slight differences there from just like the different zooms and stuff. So, so real, real quick, if if we could, um, I mean, this is this is all great stuff, but let's branch out real quick um, to some of the uh, some of the other questions we have, as well as some of the stuff we've gotten from the audience, and then we can come back to this. Yeah. Uh, I want to be conscious of the fact that we have thirteen minutes left. Ooh. Um, yeah. So, so real quick, I'm going to go to my document here um, that th we've, we've talked or it's been seen already on your slide deck, this double challenge. All right. So I know we talked about double, double buddy, but if you could real quick talk about the double, no, wait, we've talked about, we talking about the double challenge, but this is kind of talking about the double challenge a bit, but I mean, is there a challenge that you had for the audience challenge? Yeah, so I'll take that one. So what we've shown okay. so far is basically the training of the AI. The AI is the double buddy. So you think of like that, that's the personality behind it. So the challenge is, can you take what we've done as an example? Can you create something better? You know, can you use maybe a different neural network? Uh, maybe use a different board that has a different arm processor on it. Maybe there's a different neural network accelerator that would be really interesting to share uh, your results with. And, you know, document your results, create a hackster project. It is so easy to create a hackster project. Like I, every time I go to create a hackster project, I can't believe how easy it is to use the little hackster editor and go in and just add some notes as you're going along. So that way other people can recreate your work. So the challenge for everybody in the community is, uh, you know, take, take what we've done as a starting point and see if you can make a better AI or maybe apply it to a different card game and see if, you know, there's a different card game that's an interesting application for AI as well. 
Yeah, so head over to Hackster.io, uh, make an account. Yeah, it's free to make an account. It's totally yeah. free. Make a Hackster.io account. Check out their project, which we've already shared a couple times. We'll share it again at the end, and of course, it'll be available in the description. But um, let's see if, if you can challenge these three machine learning experts uh, and, and, and you know create something with their foundational work that they've put together for the Dobble Buddy. Um, that's exciting. So we have another question here. Uh, let, you know what? Let's let's dive into some of these questions from the from the YouTube, if that's okay, because we did lose track here. Uh, one with Ta one from Tyeth here. I'm, I'm going up the list here. So Tyeth asked this when you were talking, Mario. Um, what size do you crop and resize, resample the images at, and how low can you go? Did that's you, a did, that's an excellent question. We arbitrarily chose 224 by 224. The reason that number. It just got some point I was considering uh, using transfer learning and, you know, the image net, that's the typical size of the image. So that was the reasoning behind selecting that size. And it just kind of stuck there. We never did transfer learning. Um, we just did a, a training from scratch. So that's another technique that could be explored, like take an existing network, like maybe a mobile net, squeeze net maybe, and then just retrain the last layers using this technique called transfer learning. Um, but that's what was in the back of my mind when I chose 224 by 224. Um, how low can we go? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, we did not explore Double that. Challenge. Double that, challenge. That's an excellent question. <laughs> cool. All right. So that's your double challenge, Ty. Take, take that one and go with it. Uh, next question from David uh, on the chat here. He says, tons of ML applicability. I think this kind of touches on what I mentioned earlier about the whole autonomous driving. But Tons of ML applicability in the autonomous vehicle and overall robotics mobility space. Any plans for activity in these areas? So does does this amazing ML expert team here have any plans to, to go beyond the Dobble uh, Buddy project and do something uh, in the in the robotics mobility space? I'll take that one. So we didn't want to get into that too much. Uh, you know, the Double Buddy is not the only thing that we work on. That was kind of like our spare time project. Uh, but we actually have tons of other Hackstrio projects that are based upon other NXP platforms, other Xilinx platforms. We actually have a, a quad camera kit that's hooked up to another Zinc Ultra Scale platform from Xilinx where you can have four cameras like you would have on an autonomous driving vehicle. And you can create your own autonomous application uh, from that. And so we, we provide that as a base starting point for creating your own, uh, you know, ADAS application, basically. Maybe you can have us cool. back on. We'll talk more about that. Soon. <laughs> I, I was going to say, I was actually going to, uh, you mentioned, you know, you mentioned ARM a few times, right? And um, I'm actually curious this, you know, why did you choose to do this project with, you know, an ARM board, an ARM SOC, um, why not do it on your computer? Like what is, uh, you know, what brought you to actually use a, a board and, and do it on the board, right? Like, can you talk to that? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll provide the intro for that. So the idea is, you know, we did do our training on the PC, but you don't necessarily want to take a PC everywhere with you. And, you know, that may, be, may not be the most portable thing, especially if you have a big GPU on your tower sitting in the corner. Maybe if you have a laptop, that's a little bit more portable. But the idea behind using something like Maxport, which we have, I'm showing that Maxport. This is the this is a photo of Monica's desk actually here. Maxport's a low power. Uh, small form factor single board computer. It has its own little camera peripheral that hooks up to it. Uh, maybe maybe Demonica will tell a little bit more about that. But the idea is that you could have a piece of hardware that you could target it to that's that's not a PC, something with a little bit more lower power, more compact form factor. Uh, you know, Raspberry Pi could be another form factor. This one's like a very similar form factor to Raspberry Pi, similar price point as well. So you know, just varying different. Um, targets to a more embedded target was something that was very interesting to us. Uh, you know, we also have, you know, we also have Maxboard is like something that Avnet created. So you can, you can purchase Maxboard. The Ultra 96, the same thing for that. And we have the Ultra 96 board that we, that we have as different targets. And then at the end, what we'd, what we'd like to show is kind of like the highlight between all those different platforms and the different trade-offs that you have in targeting the different platforms. But maybe Monica, you can tell us more about your setup here. Oh, sure. Yeah. So actually, <laughs> yes, I'll, I'll unplug it so you can see this is um, this is Maxboard. This is Maxboard Mini, actually. So Maxboard Mini is a little bit faster than 
regular Max board, despite the name, it's it's very mighty. Um, uh, so also quad core ARM Cortex A53. Um, and I got the Maxboard camera here. So this is um, this is another Avnet product, a MIPI camera. Um, anything specific that you guys want to know about this guy? Or I think no, it's I think interesting. It's, you know, we no. we sorry, Robert. No, please, sorry. please. <laughs> no, I was just gonna say we we've done a lot of shows on uh, on uh, machine learning on the edge, right? And uh, so this is a very relevant topic. And I think mm -hmm. uh, it, it's interesting, you know, we, we started with uh, Kevin, you showing the, the power consumption, right? I think, uh, you know, we're about to, we're, we're almost towards the end, but I think it, this is a nice um, maybe segue into like discussing the differences between the different ARM cores uh, and, and the different boards that you have on, you know, on display. Uh, and, you know, what you found actually, I'm, I'm curious to see like your data on, on what you found on power consumption and performance, um, you know, analysis that you did. You want to show that last slide, Kevin? Yeah. So this is kind of like uh, the summary of everything that we did. Uh, let me pull that up here really quick. Um, so we talked about like the different power consumption. Oh, here we go. Do you see benchmark results on your end? Yeah. Yeah, we see it. <laughs> uh, so so we targeted. We started on the PC, right? So the idea behind the PC is. You know, lots of people have a PC. It's very easy to do the training portion of it. If you have a GPU, it can go a lot faster than uh, the 30 hours that we spent doing the training on our PCs. Uh, but there's downsides to that, right? The price tag of a PC is way more than an embedded hardware target. So like here, I listed the price of my laptop that I trained I train that neural network on. We measured the power. The power is 55 watts. So very flexible tool to use, but there's a huge price that you pay for, you know, in terms of power consumption and, you know, cost of the equipment that you're using. And then if you kind of compare the trade-offs with an embedded platform like Maxboard, you're talking about, you know, a very slight drop in throughput. Like we're still seeing like one to two frames per second performance on these platforms, but almost a, an entire order of magnitude of less power consumption. So for Maxboard, we're seeing somewhere around five watts. So that's, you know, that's less than 10% of what we are seeing on the PC. And then if you look at the price tag on that, like that's somewhere around, you know, between like one tenth and one twentieth of the cost of the PC. So, <laughs> you know, if you're, you're talking like price performance, you know, Maxboard is a very, very attractive platform if you don't need, you know, the full uh, performance that you get out of a PC. And it's certainly more appealing if you if you can't have the full power envelope uh, that you get with the PC. Like if you have to have a battery powered application, that PC is not going to be running very long <laughs> at 55 watts. Um, and then the other interesting too is like when you throw custom accelerators into the mix, like with Ultra 96, what we're doing with that platform, that one's using a piece of IP inside the programmable logic called a DPU, which is a deep processing unit that accelerates that neural network on there. We're getting almost the same performance in terms of throughput, 6.5 frames per second on the Ultra 96 as you get on the PC. So, um, you know, it's a little bit more costly of a platform uh, than the max board, but you know, you're getting almost the same performance as a PC and you're still, um, you're still well underneath the, the power level that you would get with a PC. So that for me, this was like the most interesting part from, you know, from an engineering perspective and trying to like make all the trade-offs. Okay. Do I need something that's low cost? Do I need something that's really low power? Do I need something that's, you know, high performance? And, you know, this was a realistic application that we could deploy on those platforms in order to make that sort of evaluation on them instead of just staring at a bunch of marketing slides. <laughs> I, I really like this. I, I think this is, you know, I, as, I, as I mentioned at the beginning, like I don't see this often, right? Like usually people talk about, uh, oh, look how great and shiny this is, but actually the, the power numbers are where, where stuff, you know, where the, the devil's is, right? Like the devil is in the power numbers because, <laughs> or actually not just the power numbers, but like throughput and, and cost, right? Like when it comes to actually doing this for your own product. Uh, I'm curious, do, can, can you remind us what the cores are on the, Max board and Max board mini are, are they the same or different? They're the same core, uh, cores, but clocked differently. So Max board mini, uh, so it's both quad core Cortex A fifty three, but the Max board mini runs at one point eight gigahertz instead of one point five gigahertz. Yeah, so that uh, platform is that platform is the NXP IMX eight. 
platform. Awesome. And then Mary, you yeah. want to talk about Ultra 96 and the differences in that platform? Uh, that one's Cortex A53. Um, there's four of those processors. Uh, the, do you remember, Kevin, how fast they're clocked? Um, these ones, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. I think, I think the standard CPU frequency, I think is about one gigahertz. Uh, there, there's different, uh, speed grades of parts since it's Xilinx, they've been the parts so you can get different speed grade parts. So you can run higher speed grades faster. They also have like industrial temperature grade parts. So if you're looking to deploy something in industrial temperature settings, um, you know, there's different performance factors involved with that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I cool. think it's pretty cool when you're talking about moving this stuff to, I, I know we have only like zero minutes left. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty cool when you talk about building these things on these embedded devices. And I think, you know, this feeds into a lot of stuff we've talked about, Alessandro, in a bunch of previous episodes, path to product, right? Like, you know, people... You, you can't just include a laptop in a product. It's just not normal. But if you wanted to sell a board game on a shelf at Target or, you know, something like that, like you need to actually think about what device, what's your supply chain? What are the things that you're going to be putting into that device to actually create the future of possible tabletop gaming? And I mean, that's, that's, I think really cool, right? Like, you know, everyone thinks of the, 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 the card game that you can play by yourself solitaire well what's the card game that you can play by yourself with ai well dabble buddy and these are the things that I think people need to start um focusing on right like you know of course i could build it on my laptop and i could run it there and yeah i'd have the same amount of fun but if i want to you know be a maker and capitalize on this and possibly you know you know push something out there to the public to the consumers i think that's definitely be exploring these embedded devices for as an option so really cool yeah. yeah, that's a really good point, Robert. And like, you know, all those boards that we showed, like Maxport Ultra 96, those are all single board computer products that appear at Avnet. Uh, you know, we, we can help you with design customization. So if you need some sort of, you know, joystick controller or something add on to that, we have the hardware design resources in house to help people do those custom hardware builds if they don't have, if they're not comfortable doing that themselves. Very nice. And that's, Very nice. that's one thing, you know, I wanted to kind of actually end on that, uh, perhaps. It's it's great to have you guys here because I think you know a lot of times like we 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 talk to people that actually you know are starting to build stuff POCs and are building you know I've got great ideas but the next step is like actually productizing it right and actually Avnet is a company that can help with that and I you know I've been talking to you guys for for a while uh, and there, you you're quite big right you've got quite a lot of different teams that, that are kind of working on different things on different aspects of the of the problem space right so it's uh you know it's it's really interesting that you can provide that support for people that do need it, right? And I think it's important to, to know that because actually, uh, you know, I think a lot of frustration go, goes on. Like there's a lot of frustration when people try to build products and then fail because they, they actually can't make it into a viable product, right? And uh, yeah, and it's good to like know who can help, right? So um, thank you. Thank you for, for sharing um, your story. And, and um, I guess we're about to wrap up. So I, I just wanted to, ask you guys if you got any last um thoughts or any last things that you want to share with the with the audience uh, and maybe we can share the link once more i guess the last thing that i'll say is um I just want to throw out that hackster link go check out the hackster link there's so many projects on hackster this is just like <laughs> many projects and if you go start on that project for the dolly it'll take you to each of the other projects that we showed along like how to train the network there's another project on how to target at the max board there's another one on how to target the ultra 96. if you come out with another target we'd love to hear about it like arm has like custom accelerators that they're coming out with and custom libraries for accelerating neural networks would love it if somebody from the community showed how to deploy that neural network onto those or another neural network that outperforms the double buddy example that we came up with. We'd love to hear about it. Double challenge. Double challenge. <laughs> double challenge. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm going to, I'm, I'm just going to ask, we, we didn't prepare this, but I'm just going to ask, are you going to create a challenge? I mean, a, a hackster challenge around this, right? Like it feels like, you know, at some point there should be something where, where people can win prizes, right? <laughs> so I'm just going to put you on the spot and say, are you going to create one? <laughs> yeah, we'd love to have Marvin for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Hey. Who's on the spot now? <laughs> but, That's a great I mean, suggestion you know, though, yeah. It, it's, it sounds like it's doable, right? So we can talk yeah. about it. 
We'll have yeah, our people awesome. reach out to your people. That's so <laughs> great. We'd love to have it. Don't contact cool. us. We'll call you. <laughs> hey, it was great. great to be on the show. Thanks for the invitation, Alessandro and Robert. This is yeah. It was so fun. Let, yeah. Let's 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 close enjoyable. this out. Let's close this out all together. Want to remind everyone, everyone watching, thank you so much for your time. Hour well spent. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, Kevin, Mario, Monica, you're amazing. Thank you so much for taking your hour, spending it with Alessandra and I here on Arms Innovation Coffee. Smash that like button, like Alessandra said, and follow the channel. We're cheersing? All right. Here we go. Cheers. Thank you so much. Right. Bye. Thanks, Alessandra and Robert.